Hey guys, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, we are finishing our, our little quest to understand priestliness, specifically in the context of apostolicity. What does it mean to be apostolic? Uh, both for the sake of understanding and comprehending those who are truly apostles and those who are only forgeries, and in understanding how we might be an apostolic body because we are built upon their foundation. And Jesus himself is called the great apostle and high priest of our confession. And if that much emphasis is brought about, brought upon the apostolic in context to the whole of the church, then we ourselves must reflect something of apostolicity, even if we ourselves don't have the distinct call. And so we're looking at priestliness, and we've looked at uh, some introductory thoughts. And last video was... On, on Aaron and the consecration of Aaron and his sons. This time we're going to finally look at Melchizedek and what does it mean that Jesus was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek? What does it mean that we are, are to be priests following, following after God under the order of Melchizedek? Let's start in Hebrews chapter 7. And I think that this is actually where I'm going to remain. I'm not going to go out too far. This is kind of my domain. Just picking one text and, and reading through it and expanding upon this one text. That, that's really, that's really where, where I seem to do best. <laughs> Which is why when I'm trying to discuss topics like priestliness, I, ha I need notes. I need these slides. Because my mind goes from here to there to everywhere else and I can't always remember to discuss everything that I want to. So, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being in, by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest forever. There's a huge mouthful in all of those statements. What does it mean for us to be of the Melchizedek priesthood, where we are uh, Melech, uh, uh, Melchizedek, which is king of righteousness, or uh, Melech Shalom, which is King of Peace. What does it mean for us to be without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, because we're supposed to be sons and daughters, adopted. There's a sonship that um, even at the beginning of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, it, it mentions that Jesus is bringing many sons to glory. He's not the only son. He's bringing many sons to glory. And and in this, how does this how does this cause for us to be to abide as priests forever? So let's whoa let's dig into this. Don't know what I just did there. Um, Jesus is our high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Being then the king of righteousness and the king of peace, how ought we to live if we are to be a part of this same order? If we're to be reflections of Jesus, as, as the cliche goes, to be Jesus to other people, how is it that we are to reflect righteousness and peace? What is it about Jesus that is so filled with righteousness, the very essence of righteousness, the very essence of peace, so that we might reflect what he is in his very fundamental core. Romans 4.3 tells us that it is faith that is accredited as righteousness. And of course, Paul isn't just pulling this out of the air. He's quoting Genesis. Abraham's faith caused him to leave father and mother, brother and sister, friend and family. It, it was Abraham's faith that caused him to, to leave the nation that he was born into and, and grew up in. And it was his faith that calls for him to believe God when God told him, you're going to have a son, and he shall be the inheritor. 
it, it, it's not going to be Eliezer, your servant. It will be your son. So, with righteousness, before I go on to peace, let me, let me just conclude the thought. With righteousness, it's not about uh, doing right things, although that is true. It's about faith, and there's a certain kind of faith. This faith leads you to not simply believing simple truths or facts or uh, believing when God gives you a promise. This kind of faith results in a certain lifestyle, a certain character, a certain uh, mode of being. This faith produces in you obedience. It produces in you uh, reaction. More than just subscribing to, yeah, I believe that God is real. Yeah, I believe that he's a trinity. Yeah, I believe that it's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. More than just checking the list and saying, I, we believe these things, there's a faith that brings forth righteousness. It, it, it brings forth, um, what is it? Um, it's not just righteous acts. It, it's, it's the very disposition of heart that everything about you is lived from a disposition of, of showing forth God's righteousness the righteous do righteously because they're righteous. It's not that the righteous works make the righteous righteous. No, they are righteous, therefore they do righteous things. Do you see what I'm getting at here? And with peace, what shall we say with peace? Shalom is more than peace. It, it, yes, it is peace, but, but it's, it's wholeness. Being sons of righteousness, we obtain peace. We have wholeness. Shalom is the very thing that I was hinting at with waiting in the, in the silence with the consecration of Aaron. Are you content to rest? Not doing anything and not needing background noise to clutter your ears. Do you have that kind of peace? Do you have the ability? Um, I think of, there's a story I have not yet recovered from. It's been four years ago. And I still have not yet recovered from it. Uh, my my father-in-law and my mother-in-law uh, moved to Ohio, where where my wife and I are. Um, and this is before we got married. They they found a house and here they found a house here, and and they were moving in. And there was someone who was helping them moving their stuff from the storage unit that they were renting to their house. And I was helping as well. And, and we were in this truck. We were driving back and forth. And when my father-in-law was in the truck, they were just talking and talking and talking and talking. When my father-in-law got, got out of the truck, the conversation ended. Why? Because they were talking about stupid nothingness. Oh, I really like the music at the church. Oh, man, I'm really glad that they're singing this style. Boy, I'm glad that they got away from those traditional hymns. It's nice to have a contemporary service. And and they're singing songs from like the 80s and 90s that were famous when I wasn't even a Christian. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is really petty. And yet this is what they wanted to uh, talk about and discuss. And here, here's, here's the point. Here's the whole here's the whole crux of the argument. When when my father-in-law got out of the car, the man wanted to try to continue the conversation with me. I didn't want to talk about stupid things. And so the conversation ended pretty quickly because he didn't want to talk about serious things. And so instead of sitting in the silence, he turned the radio on. Anything to fill the air. He could not sit in the silence. He had to have something. He had to hear the clutter. He had to hear the noise. Where is the rest that he could he was he would have been content to talk or he would have been content to sit there and be silent? And personally, I, I don't think that if you have this kind of rest that you're going to be content to talk about trivial, stupid nonsense. But um, 
I, I've seen Stranger Things. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Shalom. It's about wholeness. It's about being content with yourself. It's about finding that uh, emotional, physical, and spiritual interweaving where all things have been made complete in a way that you don't need. You're satisfied. You don't need the background noise. You don't need the television. You don't need the radio. You don't need to hear music. I remember as a teenager, that was one of the big things for me, was music. It was my way of escape. Because life itself was something that I hated. I didn't want to live. And so I, music was a place where I found uh, an ability to disengage from everything around me and just hide away. Whether it was in playing guitar or just blaring the music into my ears through headphones. I was not content with myself. I was not whole. At that time, I was also depressed and considered suicide. Interestingly, the heavenly archetype is not required upon genealogy, but Aaron's priesthood is sacerdotal. What do I mean? In order to be a priest according to the priesthood of Aaron, you had to be a son of Aaron. Sacerdotal means... Um, there's a certain order, there's a certain, there's a certain inheritance that you, you, you can only inherit this kingdom or priesthood or whatever. Think of like the monarchy where, where the kings, kings and queens, you only inherit the throne. You, you cannot have the throne because you were voted there. You can only inherit it because you are such and such place on the list and so and so died who was before you. It's not so with, with Jesus. The heavenly archetype, the, the Melchizedek priesthood, it is not about genealogy. And so the question can be, can you say that you are without father, without mother, without descendants? What does that even mean? Well, one thing, it's that you would identify as God's son or God's daughter. You would identify with with the family of God, with, with Israel and with the church, with, with those who are the people of God. This is your family. Who is my father? Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? It's they who do the will of God. It's they who do the will of my Father in heaven. It isn't that we're to bring shame to our families by forsaking them. Yet, the question can be asked, where do you draw your inheritance and your identity? Are you identified as whatever your last name is? Or is your identity and your inheritance something deeper, something of a heavenly character, a heavenly caliber? It's from Zion. To call this difficult requirement fanaticism is to transgress God. Because God so, so explicitly demands it, If, if you were put in Abraham's shoes, would you come out of, an, uh, out of nation, out of your kindred, out of your people, and out of your father's house? If you were to hear that cry, to leave your parents' house and to go to a land that I will show you, would you, would you follow that? Or would that chafe you in a way that you would want nothing to do with it? I remind you that in Exodus 32... The Levites were told to slay every father, mother, brother, sister, and son or daughter that worshipped the golden calf. Can you bring that kind of severance so that when the command of God comes, you would be willing even to slay your own father, your own mother, your own brother, your own sister? Not that it will come. It's not that I'm advocating that, that God will tell you to murder or to, to kill those who are in disobedience, but... I want you to just consider the, the severity here. This is this seems this seems extreme and, and fanatic. And yet it's the requirement of God. And to and to call it fanaticism, to call it extremism, is to degrade God. It's to bring dishonor to his name. 
what what is it that separates this act in Exodus 32 from the Islamic extremists and the jihadists? What is it that, that separates the two, that distinguishes the two, so that God is not being an extremist? Interestingly, it was after that ultimate act that God said uh, that the Levites had now been made had now been consecrated. It's now after they had done that ultimate act of even going into slaying their father, their mother, their brother, their sister, their son, their daughter, their friends. It's after that ultimate obedience that God says that the Levites had been consecrated. What's the difference? The difference is in the character. The act itself sounds familiar. The way in which it is done is utterly contrary. Whereas the Islamic extremists are very brutal, they uh, act in a way that is degrading to bring forth shame. The the act of the the Levites, where God commands this, it's very clean. It's very. Um, it still sees the person as a person. You know, I, I maybe maybe I should not get into it too deeply because maybe this is just too sensitive of a subject. So I'm going to go ahead and stop before I go too much further on that. Melchizedek had neither beginning of days nor end of life. This speaks of an eternality. Now, with that, I, I want you to I want you to under, know something. L later, <laughs> later in this series, I've got it down here somewhere. Um, here. After priestliness, the next thing is going to be the eternal perception. Um, I'm going to be talking about the eternal perception, so we're not going to get into eternality of in, in a great length in depth here. But we can give we can give a, a an understanding, at least a fundamental understanding. There's neither beginning of days nor end of life. There's an eternality. It, it stems from before the foundation of the world unto forever in the future, right? Um, until our perception is beyond our moment in time, just our little blip on the screen, we have no right to take of these holy sacrifices and priestly functions. Melchizedek had neither beginning of days nor end of life. This speaks of an eternality. Oh, look at that. <laughs> um, I must have... Okay, interesting. Um, this is a priest outside of time, without interruptions. This priestliness is an outflow from the throne on the basis of the indestructible life. What am I getting at? A view of eternity, which we'll delve into more fully later, later, is formed when we have truly entered into that tabernacle and seated with Christ in heavenly places and waited on God in his presence for the full seven days. Entering the tabernacle is climbing the mount, Psalm 24, which is Zion, which, by the way, when you come to Hebrews 12, after all of this discussion, Hebrews 12, 22 says, But ye have come to Zion, to the new Jerusalem. What does it mean when it says, You have come to Zion? Not you are coming, nor that you will come. You have come. What does that mean? There's a building in the book of Hebrews that these concepts are all interwoven. That when you understand Hebrews 1 and 2, you can then move to Hebrews 3 and 4, and you see, oh, this is actually building upon 1 and 2. And when you come to the comprehension of Hebrews 3 and 4, you can then move to Hebrews 5 through 7, and you start to realize, oh, this is actually building upon the rest that was spoken in, spoken of in, in Hebrews 3 and 4. And when you, when you start to understand priestliness and the Melchizedek priesthood and the sacrifice of Christ, and that we are also called to display this Melchizedek priesthood, you can then go into... Hebrews um, 
8 through 10, which speaks of the sacrifice itself. And, and you can start to understand this and how it builds upon Melchizedek and the heavenly archetype. And you can go from Hebrews 10 to 11 to realizing, oh, all of the saints, from Abel onward, all of the saints have been a part of this. This is the faith once and for all given. And we're all a part of this together. We're all a part of the Melchizedek priesthood. We're all within the rest that was established even from the foundation in that one in that one section as the, he, at the, as the author of Hebrews says, in that one place where it says, uh, and God rested from his work. And so when we enter into the rest, we too have rested from our own work. And, and in Hebrews 10, it talks about coming into the holy of holies by the new and living way, and, and that God has um, rent the veil open through his flesh. And so we are welcomed to come into the holiest place, and, and that these saints in, in Hebrews 11 have all come to this comprehension. And so then you come to the discussion of Hebrews 12, where uh, cast aside all the things that hinder you, and you're not under the Mosaic covenant. You come to the, the thing that, that the Mosaic covenant was patterned after, the very heavenly reality. You're not going into the Holy of Holies in the earthly temple or the earthly tabernacle. You're going into the very heavenly Holy of Holies. And because of this, you've not come to Sinai with its burning and with, where Moses himself even said, I'm trembling and very afraid. You have come to Zion. Do you see how all of this plays together? How can we understand these things? This is a comprehension of the eternal reality. It's not just eternality in the sense of understanding um, all of time and, and all of that which is beyond and transcendent of time. It's a comprehension of the eternal things in and of themselves. But how can we understand these things when we ourselves are flesh and blood? It's because everything is spiritual. It's because God has given us these patterns that reflect the heavenly. And he's shown us over and over and over again these patterns and these cycles in the scriptures so we can understand, we can, we can comprehend. He's not left us barren and without any testimony. Ephesians 2.6 and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are seated in heavenly places. So even though, even though while we are still yet on the earth, as Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, uh, he, he makes this phrasing, uh, no one's been to heaven except for the Son of Man, uh, who is in heaven. Not that he, he's from heaven. He is in heaven. Almost, he's making the statement that even though while he's standing there in front of, uh, in the front of Nicodemus on the earth, he, he makes a statement that sounds like he's trying to say he is currently in that moment in heaven. And so it is here that we are not simply here on the earth, but we're ambassadors. We are currently seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 8, 4. Now, if he, Jesus, were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Somehow, somehow Jesus has a true dwelling in the heavenly sanctuary, and that is precisely what makes him a priest. Do you see what I'm getting at here? There's something here that's taking place, that, that Jesus is dwelling, whether it's on the earth or whether it's in heaven. Because at all times, his true dwelling is in the heavenly sanctuary. That is precisely what makes him a priest. There are two types of humanity. When you look at the book of Revelation, it, it is cut and dry like this. There are they who are the inhabitants of the earth, and there are they who are dwelling in heaven. In Revelation, it is they who are inhabiting the earth, whose only knowledge is the things of the earth, that mourn for the devastation of the earth, and the demise of Babylon, and, and the Antichrist, and, and, but the, the, the people who dwell in heaven, when, when the serpent is cast down, they are rejoicing. It is interesting in Exodus 25 that God gives excruciating detail about what is inside the tabernacle. Only the priests were allowed to enter, and only the high priest could enter the holiest place, 
and and that only once a year. But yet God still gives us plain and concise details about everything that we would find in that tabernacle and in that holiest place. It's almost like he wants to let us know, even though you yourself are not going to be allowed in here, I want you to see it. This is something that God does not want to hide. It's not a secret. The reason that only select few are allowed in is because they are the consecrated ones who are allowed to work with that which is holy, that which is sacred. It's because God sees sees this as sacred and precious. And so we, who have not been consecrated, are not allowed to enter. But he still wants us to see it. He does not want us to be without uh, understanding. So I find that interesting. Hopefully you do too. Let's look at Revelation. When you read Revelation 4, 2 through 8, these are the things that you see. You see the throne of God. You can compare what what John is seeing, the throne of God with, with Ezekiel 1 and 2, with Isaiah 6, with 1 Kings 22, 19, that um, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and he who sat upon the throne. And in Micaiah in 1 Kings 22, 19, it says that he saw God and he saw the throne and he who sits upon it. Ezekiel 1 also has this where you see the four living creatures carrying the throne like like the, the Levites would carry the, the Ark of the Covenant upon their shoulders and the throne of God. And, and you see the same kind of radiance. We're going to find that later here. Um, there's the rainbow and there's the uh, the rainbow that, that goes around the throne here. And you find that in Ezekiel 1.28. Uh, you see the living creatures in Ezekiel 1, 5 and 1, 10. You see them in Isaiah 6 as well. They're the ones who cry, holy, holy, holy. Uh, you see the jasper sardis stone in appearance, that the, um, that the throne itself is a jasper color. And, and this is in Exodus 24, 10, that the, that the street that leads up to, to the throne where the, where the 72 elders and Aaron and his sons and, and Moses had um, walked up the the road up to see God and to have and to have dinner with him to sup with him to eat and drink with him this is this is the description that the road was like sapphire the 24 elders that sit around the throne this is reflecting of the 24 priestly families according to 1 chronicles 24 there's thundering and lightning just like there was thundering and lightnings upon uh, Sinai in Exodus 19:16. There are seven lamps, just like you have the seven lamps of uh, Exodus um, 25:37, and there's the menorah of Zechariah 4:2, and you see there's a sea of glass, and in 1 Kings 7:23, Solomon builds quote the sea. Do you see how these these um, earthly things that we can read about their description, they're reflecting to us the very heavenly tabernacle. This is what we've come unto, the priesthood of which we minister. The ark of God was God's throne itself. And I give you these these uh, multiple verses here so you can look it up. I'm not lying to you. This self-same throne is what we are charged to draw near with boldness into the holiest place by the blood of Jesus, since he has opened it up through the veil of his flesh. That's what we're entering into when we pray. This is what we're coming before in, in order to pray. This, this should be a somber and a, a or a, um, a solemn, not a somber. This should be a, sol- a solemn and a holy thing. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. We are given access into the very throne room of God. There has been made a way into the holy of holies where the angels cry out, Holy, holy, holy. And where the elders lay down their crowns in worship. In this solemn place, we live and move and have our being. This is the eternal perception. This is what it means to be without beginning of days or end of life. And yet, whom, how many of us have this? In this heightened awareness, there is nothing trivial. 
Everything is significant, consecrated, having an eternal weight of glory. There is only one garment for the priests, and it wasn't tailored with time. When you when you look at um, the garment that, that was put upon Aaron as the high priest, and then the garments for his sons, it, it's not like it's not like if the high priest is taller than the previous one, well, this garment's not going to fit him very well, and so we'll have to make a new one. No, he gets to wear it, and it's just going to be a little too short for him. To live up to anything less, you must be fitted into this one garment, this priestly garment, and to live up to anything less, ministering out of our own life and ability, and living from an absence in comprehension of the of the eternal things is to fall short of priestly ministry. Either we are priestly in our ministry or we're not. And if we're not priestly in our ministry, is it really ministry? It might be our service to God, but that does not then demand that it would be ministry. Every call of God, whether an, whether an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, pastor, or a teacher, must first be priestly. You might have a legitimate call, God requiring that you be a certain role in the body of Christ, but you cannot enact that without this first being formed in you. You must be priestly. Otherwise, you forfeit your call. You have a function, which is how God has created you as you. He's made you with a personality, with a way that you think, with a way that you perceive things. And he's made you to be that. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be refined. Certainly, you can. But he's created you to be you. And from that, you're meshed together within the body as a certain function, having a certain point, a place in the body that you, that you are. Not everybody's part of the hand. Not everybody's part of the eye. Some people are part of the inward parts that, that don't get seen. Some people are part of the bloodstream, the, the red blood cells that take the oxygen to and, and fro in the body. Uh, some people are, are part of the um, some people are part of the cells that are within the tissue, in the muscle within the forearm. Or or maybe you're you're a tendon or a ligament, or maybe you're um, Maybe you're something altogether, a cartilage, a piece of cartilage in the ear, or... Look, it, it, this eventually the body um, analogy breaks down, where people start asking, well, what does it mean to be this or that? that that's, not, that's not the point of the analogy. The analogy is, you have your own purpose and role within the body, within the body of Christ. You have your own function uh, that God has created you to be this because that's simply just how you're made. You don't expect a red blood cell to act like a white blood cell. That's why you have red blood cells and white blood cells because they both act differently. You see what I'm getting at? And in the body of Christ, in the church, in Israel, you don't have, you don't expect that... Um, the foundational man, the apostle or the prophet, is going to act like an evangelist or a pastor because that's not who they are. You don't expect the one who, who is gifted with administration to act like uh, those who are not gifted with administration. You see what I'm getting at? From, from there, from that function which you might have, you might have a call And that call would, would be to do and to be something specific. It might be that you're called to have apostolicity or to have priestliness. But that doesn't mean that you're, you're called to have an office of apostle. Do you see what I'm getting at? God might give you the call to be apostolic or to be prophetic or to be pastoral or to be um, evangelical or to be uh, teaching, but... That doesn't mean that you have the office of pastor, teacher, evangelist, apostle, or prophet. Maybe God has just given you that call to do and to be that, but not to fulfill the office. There's a difference. The office itself is a, is a much higher demand. 
the calling, you can have a prophetic call where God has invested in you a, a, a perception and, and maybe the prophetic gift. And so you have a, a few um, prophetic nuances. But to have the office itself is something altogether different. And I think one of the um, one of the struggles in our modern day and age, we have a lot of people who have the call to be an apostle, or they have a a grand gift of administration, and people think that's apostolic, one or the other. But they do not hold the office of apostle. Same thing with the prophet. There are a lot of people who have a gift of prophecy. But they themselves do not hold the office of prophet. And God might have given them the call, but not the office. Same thing can go for the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. Just because God has given you a call does not mean that you need to go to seminary to figure out what it means to be a pastor or whatever it is. Often one of the things obviously lacking in our pulpits is anything of priestliness. I mean, this is the fundamental characteristic of all of the offices. And in fact, this is a characteristic of anyone who's to be called apostolic or prophetic in any sense. Even in the sense of being part of an apostolic body. Why is it so lacking? Why is this reality so uh, dearth? It's so barren. It might well be that, that your pastor was called, but only as a minister and not as the office of pastor. Can you discern the difference? It might be that God has granted that they should have that office, but that apprehension prematurely is acting like Absalom, who stole the throne from his father David. To, to be given the office, or to be told by God that he's giving you the office of pastor, of teacher, of prophet. To say, well, you know, God has told me I'm supposed to be a prophet, and then you start to act like you have the role and function prematurely. It is detrimental. Think of David, who is told by Samuel the prophet himself that David is going to have the kingdom. He's going to inherit the throne. Jonathan knows David is going to be the king. And Jonathan tells David, you're going to be the king, and I'm going to be right there next to you. Now, ultimately, we know that Jonathan died in battle, and that wasn't fulfilled. But they made a covenant over it. And what beautiful thing might it have been if that actually took place? Even in 1 Samuel 24, when David cuts off the hem of, of Saul's robe and, um, and shows Saul, look, I, I spared you this day. Saul then makes the statement, now I know you will indeed be king. David was told over and over and over again he was going to be king. All of the people knew it. Saul knew it. Jonathan knew it. Samuel told him. Everyone's telling David, you're going to be king one day. And yet never, not one time, do you see David reaching for that throne. Never. Even in the beginning of 2 Samuel after Saul dies and David is anointed king, he does not try to force his way into that position. That is the difference between when God has granted someone the office and when someone has either prematurely or just flat out blabbed and grabbed and they, they haven't even received the office. They haven't received the call. There's a huge difference between the two. One is like Absalom, the other one like David. The priest does not move simply because they see a need. They're content to wait, knowing that God has sufficient means to meet that need in his own way. If it is not what God has called us to do, then someone else will receive that call. I mean, do you see how that's freeing? If God has not called me, 
to to be a part of such and such food food pantry or or shelter or something else or or if the church that you go to if God is not called that you guys would have something like that well then God will call somebody else to and so you don't have to waste your finances and you don't have to waste your uh, your means just let it be if God has called if God has not called you to doing something or being something then someone else will receive the call. You don't have to be the hand. You can be content to be the foot or to be a part of the liver that is cleansing the body. Just because we perceive some need does not mean that we must satisfy that need. Just because you perceive it doesn't mean that God is necessarily calling you to um, ratify it. So to conclude then, Priestliness is the act of waiting obedience unto God in all things. Without that characteristic, which is the tangible expression of heaven through an earthen vessel, all of our ministry and all of our doing for God is actually detrimental and doing much damage. Because we're acting out of ourself, we're acting out of our own sight, like Moses, he saw how the, Israel, how the Israelites were being oppressed. He saw, therefore he acted. But when we wait and we, and we hear God say, I have seen, therefore go, it's a completely different statement. No longer are we doing anything detrimental or damaging that leads to a buried Egyptian For this reason, there are many who don't believe and mock and ridicule our Christianity. It's not because... Look, I don't, I, I don't know that I can tell you how many times I talk to people who don't believe, and I ask them, why don't you believe? And usually, the answer is not, well, science has told me. A majority of the time, I don't know, I don't know about a, a bulk majority, but a majority of the time, probably 60% of the time, the reason people say they don't believe is because they don't see it. We say that we believe in this God and that this God is full of love and compassion and mercy, and all they know is when when they went to church, it was just a bunch of fluff and selfishness, or or when when they grew up in church, they started wrestling with these questions in junior high and high school, and there weren't any answers, and so they assumed that meant that there aren't answers. And they're not going to dedicate themselves to something that's going to neuter their thinking. I don't know how many times I can tell you I've heard this. The reason is not because science has disproven God, or because the atheist arguments are so much more compelling. It is because they have not seen the reality of it. It is because we lack priestliness and the tangible expression of heaven through an earthen vessel. So, you can see I haven't even started on eternal perception. Um, so I don't know when that one will start to come out, but until next time, thanks for listening. Um, I pray that this creates in you a zeal and a jealousy where you are unable to live without this reality being expressed in you and that it would cause for you to get on your face and not just listen to a video and say, oh wow, that was really cool, but to get on your face and pray and cry until there are tears. Because without this, we're doing nothing but harm. So, I bless you in Christ. Grace and peace to you.